What's up, Journey? God is in the house today. Amen. Woo. He is a good, good God. So we find ourselves still in the series Jesus, uh, the series Jesus Stories today. And today we're going to talk about the miracle of Jesus walking on water. Yes, the guy in the wheelchair with one leg is talking about the miracle of walking on water. Because it truly is going to be a miracle when I walk. Right, it's going to be a miracle. But that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I titled this message, The Right Focus. Because uh, truly it's about having the right focus. How many of us in here um, have been so focused on something that everything else around us disappears? Right, like we're so focused on the task at hand that everything just disappears. Um, I mean, it could be even to the point where you're driving and you go, how did I get here? Right? How did I get to where I'm at right now? I don't remember that drive that I just had. Uh, I mean, some of us have that selective hearing, right? Like if we're sitting there watching TV or something and I just, it's, I just don't hear what's going on, right? I can hear the TV fine, but just nothing else around me. Or if we're playing sports, I can remember playing golf. And, you know, when I first started, you had to have that focus. You know, you had to be, everything had to be quiet, had to be still, had to focus on the task at hand. And then I started having kids and they came out to the golf course with me and there was definitely no quietness, right? But you learn to have that focus to where if you focused on the task at hand and what was in front of you and only what was in front of you, everything else disappeared. There was no other distractions that were going on. And that's what we're going to see in this story today. Uh, with the right focus, nothing is impossible. Father God, I, I just pray that your words are heard today, Father. Shut my mouth with what doesn't need to be heard, but only what you want to say, Father God. I pray that you give us ears to hear what it is that you want from us. Soften our hearts and let us just grow closer into you and what it is that you want from us. We give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, we're going to talk about Jesus walking on water. And you can find this story in Matthew 14. You can find this story in Mark 6. You can find this story in John 6. But today we're going to focus mostly on Matthew's story that we find in Matthew 14. I'll bring in some of the other aspects to help with the understanding from the other Gospels. But uh, we're going to mostly be focusing on Matthew's account today. So setting the stage of where we are. So this day started off, it was a hard day for them. It began with the hearing of John the Baptist being beheaded. And then Jesus was suggesting, hey, let's, let's go across, let's go over to this secluded place. And when they arrived there, they found a crowd there. They already found a crowd. So Jesus was ministering to them, healing their sick that day, throughout the day. And then late in the afternoon, the disciples are like, hey, let's, let's get these guys out of here. And Jesus is like, we got to feed them. And these guys are like, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. And we see a miracle there, right? We see the miracle of feeding the 5,000. So this is exactly where we're at right after that miracle happened. We pick up in Matthew's account in verse 22 of Matthew 14. And it says, immediately afterward, he compelled the disciples to get into the boat and to go ahead of him to the other side. While he sent the crowds away, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone, but the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves. For the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter responded and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened, and when he began to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out with his hand, took hold of him, and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are truly God's son. There is so much in this story right here. There are so many things that are in here. But let's just take a look at them and let's go through these verses. So verse 22, immediately after he compelled the disciples to get into the boat and to go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. 
So Jesus, he had to draw away, right? He had to send the crowds away, but why? It doesn't tell us why did he have to send the crowds away. Well, like I said, if you look at John 6's account of this story, we can see what happened. John 6, 15, so Jesus, aware that they intended to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. So once again, they're looking for that earthly king, right? Why? Because they've seen him do these miracles all day long. They were healing all day long. Jesus was healing the sick all day. So in Matthew 14, 14, we see this. When he came ashore, so this is after he heard John the Baptist has been beheaded. He wanted to go to this secluded place. He comes ashore, and this is what it says. When he came ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion to them and healed their sick. So they're looking for that earthly king right now. They're looking for that person that's taken away this sick, all the sickness, right? That's what they're doing. So if we're not careful, sometimes we can see somebody praying for somebody and this person gets healed, this person gets set free, this person gets delivered, and if you're not careful, you'll find yourself chasing after the person that was praying for that individual. I got to go to that person. I got to have that person pray for me instead of going and to the one that sets them free, which is Jesus. Jesus is who, who set them free. Jesus is who healed them. Right? That is who we put our focus on, not the person that's praying for that individual. In verse 23, it says, after he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. And we see this multiple times. Right? We see this multiple times in scripture where Jesus draws away, goes to a secluded place to be alone with the Father in prayer. We ourselves have to find that quiet time. We ourselves have to find that secluded place to draw away, to be in that quiet time alone with the Father. Can I argue with you for a second that if we're supposed to give of our time, our talent, and our treasures, that 10% would be a bare minimum of that. And if 10% of our time, just think about this for a second, two and a half hours of your day. Two and a half hours of your day giving to the Lord of your time. May we find our quiet time, our secluded place with a father. He's there waiting for you. He's there in the morning when you wake up. He's there at night. He's there all the time. He wants to have that relationship with you. And it doesn't have to be just that secluded place that you go to. He wants to be in conversation with you daily. In verse 24, but the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, He came to them walking on the sea. So we see Jesus has sent the crowd away. He's gone into the secluded time, away in prayer with the Father. And now in verse 24, Matthew's talking about the boat already being a long distance from the land. So we see the boat's out there. So Matthew says it's a long distance from the land. In Mark's account, he says it's in the middle of the sea. And in John's account, he says it's 25 to 30 stadia out which is about three to four miles out to sea. So why are these accounts different? Why does John say three to four? Why does Mark say in the middle? Why is Matthew saying it's a long ways out there? Let's talk about how we describe some things, right? If I ask everybody in here, how long is the Buckman Bridge? I'm going to get a lot of different answers. I'm gonna get, it's a long ways. I don't know. It's three miles long, right? It depends on what we know and how we perceive things and our perspective on what we get. Let me tell you, let me give you another example. If I'm out on Kingsley Lake at Camp Blanding, that lake's about two miles, right, across. If I'm out in the middle of the, the pond or the uh, lake there and I say, hey, I just caught a huge fish. I was out in the middle of Camp Blanding's lake. Someone else might say, hey, we were a mile offshore when we caught that fish. It's the same place. We're in the middle of the lake or a mile off the shore, so it doesn't matter. It's all about the perspective of what the person's writing. I say all that because guess what? That sea that they were talking about is about seven miles wide. So a long distance in the middle of it and 25 to 30 stadia is all the same spot where they were at, right? Amen. So they're all out there in the middle of this sea, storm's coming, it's there and it's the fourth watch. Does anybody know what the fourth watch is? Right, it's about three o'clock in the morning. So. We know the disciples got into the boat at evening time. Now it's been a long time. It's three in the morning. They've only gone halfway across, basically the length of the Buckman Bridge. They've rowed, right, in this long amount of time. 
So how fierce was this storm that they were trying to row against? How strong was the weather that they were trying to go against? How strong are some of the storms that we have to face in life that we're trying to row against that we feel like we're getting nowhere at, right? How many of us have those storms that we're rowing into? And remember, this isn't the first time these guys have encountered storms. They're fishermen. They know about these storms, right? This isn't the first time that they've seen a miracle happen on the water either. So in Matthew 8, Mark 4, and Luke 8, it tells the story of Jesus calming the storm. So they've seen him already be able to have power over the nature. They've seen him conquer a storm in their life. How many of us have seen Jesus do miracles in our life and we still get through a storm and we still are not relying on him and we're still focusing on the storm that we're going through instead of realizing what he's already done for us before. So these, di- these disciples know that Jesus can control nature. So why are they straining? Why are they not calling out to the one that can control? They don't think he's there. Right? That time he was in the boat with them. This time he's not in the boat with them. He's three or four miles off, right, on the shore. He's not there with them. They think maybe he can't see them. Right? He's not in the boat with them, but he sees Some of you in here right now may think he can't see what I'm going through or he's not there with me. He's there. He's with you. He sees. He's always with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And when he starts a good work in you, he's going to see it through to completion. He's going to. So why were the disciples going to the other side anyways? Because Jesus told them to. So if Jesus told them, hey, you're going to the other side, You're going to the other side. He's going to complete a good work in you, right? They're going to make it. The disciples should have realized, hey, Jesus told us to go to that other side. If Jesus is telling me to go there, I'm going to be okay. No matter what I have to go through, no matter what's put in front of me, I'm going to be okay when my focus is right and when it's fixated on Jesus. But they think they're alone. They forget all about it because their vision is fixated on that storm. And when we get in that storm, it's easy to focus on the negatives. It's easy to focus on everything else that's around us that's bad instead of truly putting our focus on the positives on Jesus. So in Mark 6, we find in 48, it says, seeing them straining at the oars for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night. He came to them walking on the sea and he intended to pass by them. So like I said, he saw them, right? He can see them straining at the oars. But look at what Mark says. It says that he intended to pass them by. So does that mean that he was just going to pass by and then get in the boat? Or was he going to truly pass by just to say, hey, guys, look it. It's me. Remember what I did last time? Remember what I did last time? But it doesn't matter which one it was that he was going to do. Look what the disciples did when they saw him walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. They couldn't even recognize who it was. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. They cried out in fear. They were terrified. They thought this was a ghost, like somebody that had died at sea that's now haunting them here, and this ghost is walking on the water to them, right? They couldn't even really see who it was because their focus was on everything else. You see, the opposite of faith is fear, right? Their faith had disappeared. Their fear has taken over, and the opposite of the fear then would have been their faith. They couldn't tell it was Jesus while they were in the storm because their fear had overcome them. They did not have the right focus. But what did Jesus do to them, right? What did he do? He just spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Can I tell you he's saying that to somebody in here today? He's saying the same thing to some of us in here today. Maybe to all of us in here. Take courage, right? Lean on him. Cast all your worries, all your doubts, all your fears, all your anxieties. Whatever it is that you're going through. Cast it on to him. So look what Peter says now. So he sees this ghost walking on the water, doesn't know who it is. Jesus calls out to him, hey, take courage. It's I. Look what good old Peter says. 
Peter responded and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Some of us may be thinking that Peter's testing Jesus right now. He's not. He truly just wanted to get to Jesus. He truly just wanted to be with Jesus and get to him. And he truly didn't care what he had to do. Just, hey, let me come to you. I don't care what it is. I want to get to you. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to follow Jesus and do what it is that Jesus wants us to do. So as Peter asked him, this is what Jesus said to him. Jesus said, come. No elaborate thing, no big stuff. He said, come. Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. All Jesus had to say to him was come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water. That's another miracle today. Peter walking on water. Right? So not just Jesus walking on water. Peter's walking on the water coming to him. How many times does Jesus tell us to come and we're like, but when? But why? Where do you want me to go? What, I don't have the resources to do this. Who do you want me to go talk to? I don't think you want me to talk to them. That's what you want me to do? But how am I supposed to do it? Like Peter didn't even ask what foot should I lead with. Mine's easy, the left. Right? <laughs> He didn't even ask that question. He literally heard Jesus say, come, and he jumped out of the boat and started walking on the water. He didn't even ask. He just, that's it, let's go, we're gonna go. But look what happened, right? Look what happened. The storms disappeared. Everything disappeared for Peter at that particular time when his focus became the right focus fixated on Jesus. He was walking on the water with Jesus. None of the others did. Peter's boldness, right? He listened and he stepped out of the boat. No second guessing, no questioning, just did it. All the distractions, all the wind, all the, what the storm had to offer him at that time disappeared completely for him. And his focus was only on Jesus and began to do exactly what Jesus was doing. Hebrews 12, 2, the beginning part of it says, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of our faith. I mean, this is amazing. He's walking on the water. <laughs> but look what just a glance, just a little glance could do. Verse 30, but seeing the wind, he became frightened. And when he began to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Just a glance, and he's seen the wind. He's seen the storm, and his focus shifted completely from the positive of Jesus to now of fear. His faith went away, right? He sees the storms. Oh, how am I going to be able to do all this stuff now? And he starts to sink. When it comes to our worship with the Lord, our focus needs to be on Jesus and Jesus alone. Because if it's on anything else... We're going to see all the distractions. We're going, to see, we're going to see everything else that's going wrong around us, right? But Mike, you don't understand. It's so distracting. I know. It can be distracting. But if our focus is directly on Jesus, we won't see anything else. We won't see lyrics being messed up or lights going crazy or sound being messed up or people walking around or nothing. If our focus is completely on him, especially in our everyday lives too. Well, these things are going wrong at work or that's going wrong. If our focus is completely on the one. Amen? That's where our focus needs to be on. May we always have our focus on him. And another thing in this verse that really jumped out to me. If you notice, as he's beginning to sink, as he's beginning to go under, he cries out to the Lord. And to the Lord alone at that point. He didn't cry out to anybody in the boat. He didn't cry out to anybody else but the Lord and the Lord alone because it was only Jesus that was going to save him at that time. There was nobody else that was going to reach him to save him at that time. And I say this, if you're having marriage issues, financial issues, people issues, Facebook issues, whatever the issues are that you're having, don't wait till you're sinking to turn to help because you're going to have to call on the Lord. You're going to need that miracle, and he can still do it. He's a miracle worker, right? But myself, Pastor Adam, the church, we're not going to be able to help you as quickly as what the Lord can at that particular time. 
So I say that to say, come before you're sinking. Come before that point so we can help you. Amen? So and then verse 31, so you know what, Pete, what Jesus did, what did Jesus do when Peter cried out? 31, 32, and 33, we see this. Immediately, that word's important. Immediately, there was no delay. Jesus reached out with his hand, took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are truly God's son. He reached down and picked him up immediately. And he said to him though, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? May we never doubt Jesus. Can I tell you something that I realized yesterday? I'm not perfect. I'm kidding. I always know I'm not perfect. But seriously, I'm, I'm preaching to myself more than I ever preach to anybody else. Right? And yesterday was a very fitting tale for me in that situation. We had a journey out that was going on out here in the back parking lot. And we're trying to get more things happening with journey out. So we had a manual project out there, which is they do health care for homeless or for those that can't really afford the health care. They come out here and they give a free service for health care. And then we also had this service called Free Flow, which they come out and they provide a shower and they provide hygiene products and laundry. It's a mobile unit. It's amazing for the homeless or those that just can't afford it, right? And we were able to do this because God put it on my heart back in January that, man, I really wish we could get showers out here and some health care out here. And he provided for it. Like he provided everything for it. He put the right people in places, right? But yesterday, I remind you, I've already prepared a message and was working on a message, right, about doubt. Yesterday, I find myself doubting. I go, man, why did I bring a manual project out here? There's no one out here. I'm wasting their time. Why did I bring free flow out here? I'm wasting their time. There's nobody out here for it. Can I tell you, there was a little girl that came yesterday that had needed help for like two months. And I said, well, we only, I went to some of the ladies that were serving and I said, well, we only have the pediatrician. The joy that came over their face when I said that was remarkable. They said, we really need a pediatrician. That's exactly who we needed today because this little girl's here and she needs a doctor to help her. Why did I doubt? Why did I doubt? And then free flow, there was a guy that walked up close to the very end, backpack on, he sees free flow and he's just, you know, he's got the look of just being down and he goes over to free flow and he takes a shower and he comes out and he's filled with joy and emotion and I've never felt this way before. Why did I doubt? Right? Why did I ever doubt what God could do? Right? It just shows me right there, right? When we question the disciples, like, you just saw him feed the 5,000. Why do you not believe that he's going to walk on the water, right? I was preparing a message, and I caught myself doubting what God, can, may we never doubt what God can do. Amen. So there's four things that I want to leave you with today, all right, before we get going. So number one, we cannot be saved by our own efforts. You see, if there isn't a better picture of salvation here, they were struggling in the boat. We're struggling in life. What does Jesus do? He sees them and he comes out to them. He makes his presence known to them, right? They're frightened by him. And Jesus tells them who he is. Peter wants to walk on the water with him, starts walking towards him, but never truly stays focused or committed on that. And as he starts to sink, Peter calls out to the Lord. And Jesus reaches down. He reaches down and picks him up and saves him from sinking and saves his life. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast and most stop there saying, see, I don't have to do any works. But verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You see, you have to have an element of faith, an action part that has to take hold. That faith that Peter had was shown in the works of calling out to the Lord when he was sinking. And he's calling out to the Lord. He's not cleaning himself up first, 
right? He's not trying to get himself right. He's calling out to the Lord. All that cleaning up and all the works come afterwards, like what it says in verse 10. You see, first you must have the faith, and your faith having an action in calling out to the Lord. But how? Romans 10, 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Jesus reached down, picked him up, and saved him. It wasn't Peter saving himself. Peter was a fisherman. You know, he could handle himself out on the water, but he couldn't even save himself, right? Jesus had to save him. And with Jesus saving him, allowed him to go on to those works that were prepared for him beforehand. What were those works? He went on to preach at Pentecost and 3,000 come to know Jesus. Those works that were prepared beforehand, that doesn't mean everything's going to be fine and dandy after he picks you up and saves you and life's going to be just great, right? Peter also is the guy that went on to deny Jesus three times as well, right? So, number two, God's saving grace is given in an instant. In an instant. Jesus' hand reached out right away, like I said, immediately to lift Peter out of the water. Instantly rescued. Number three, there is rebuking and correction along with saving. I know you don't like to hear that. I don't like to hear it and I had to hear it yesterday. Right? There is rebuking and correction along with saving. Immediately once Jesus picked him up out of the water, this is what he said to him. Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? You see that rebuking, that correction, right? That's what leads on to those works afterwards. That's what leads us into that holiness to become more holy and righteous, right? To make us just like Jesus every day of our life. Number four is to maintain the right focus. So as you see an example here, this is also an example of some of us, our walk with Christ is. You see, we start off our walk with the Lord and we're totally committed. We're totally sold out, right? Um, With the right focus at hand, He says, come, and we go, we listen to everything, but then life happens. Life comes, and storms come in our way, and our minds get focused on other things and these storms and what's going on around us, and we get distracted, and we take our eyes off from him. We begin to sink, and our walk begins to sink, and then we try to save ourselves with our own knowledge, with our own being and our own strength instead of truly putting all of our attention back onto the one who can fix it all. But if we just call out to him, he'll be able to set us free, heal us, and lift us up. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So as we close, I encourage you to rise to your feet right now. This is how I want to close today. You see, this is what he's telling some of you right now. He's telling you to come to humble yourself. He's telling you to come and lay it down at the altar right now. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. Stop trying to work things out on your own. Stop trying to figure it out in your mind and work on your own strengths and lean on your own strengths, but to lean on him. Simply lay it down at his feet. The altar team's gonna be up here. And I'm telling you, if he's talking to you right now, come. I mean right now. You can come and lay it down at his feet. The altars are open. Don't wait until the band starts to sing. Come. Get out of the way of your own mind. If you have marriage problems, if you need healing, if you you have depression going on, you need healing from that, doubt, job worries, whatever it is that you have going on in your life, come. Stop trying to figure out when, where, how, what, when. Just come to him and lay it down. And you know what happened when they saw this? When they saw people, when they saw Jesus perform this miracle, you know what they did? They worshiped him. Verse 33, and those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are truly God's son. 
We worship him for what he's going to do. We give him thanks in advance for what he's going to do because he still is a miracle worker. And that's what I want to do right now. So come, if you have anything, lay it down at his feet. And we're going to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords.